Hi, virtual PopCon attendees, and thanks for tuning in to this presentation about punk songs and boredom. When I proposed this paper back in November, I did not anticipate how relevant the topic of boredom would become. Boredom is hardly the most serious consequence of the global pandemic, but our opportunities to become bored have arguably multiplied with more people staying at home and maintaining social distance. In response, news outlets have been full of helpful tips for coping with boredom, publishing listicles or profiles of intimidatingly self-disciplined psychiatrists like this one. I much prefer this helpful guide titled 15 Punk Songs to Beat the Boredom, which appeared in Kerrang! on March 30th, just one week into lockdown in the UK. Magazine contributor Morat assures readers stuck inside with nothing to do but watch television that generations of punk musicians sympathized with them. Number one on Morat's list is the song Boredom from the Buzzcocks 1977 debut EP Spiral Scratch. Singer Howard Devoto complains of disinterest in life, impotence, monotony, and a humdrum scene. Midway through the track, his feelings are musically illustrated by a repetitive, arguably boring guitar solo. I'm already a I concur with Morat that punk rock musicians have written a lot of songs about boredom over the past 45 years, and will augment his list in the presentation that follows. Beyond illustrating the prevalence of boredom as an overt lyrical theme in many U.S. and British punk songs, I hope to show that this emotion is often the motivation for creating music in the first place. Boredom is linked to another major theme in punk and the theme of this conference, that of youth, both as it relates to the age of its performers and to the subject matter portrayed in its lyrics. In a classic 1953 essay, the psychoanalyst Otto Finichel defined boredom as an unpleasurable experience of a lack of impulse. In other words, an unmet need for external stimulation. While most human beings have the capacity to experience boredom, a baseline amount of privilege, safety, comfort, and leisure are required for boredom to manifest itself. Social science studies suggest that boredom is more widespread in wealthy nations and that men are more likely than women to become bored. And incidentally, almost all of the relevant punk songs I've compiled for this presentation are written and performed by white men. The literature scholar Patricia Myers Fax writes that the word boredom entered the English language as work and leisure time became increasingly differentiated during the 19th century. Boredom ceased to be a problem of the idle rich and became more democratized. Theodore Adorno concurred with this in his essay Free Time, which contains an extensive discussion of boredom as a byproduct of workers' lack of power and choice. In his History of Boredom, the classicist Peter Tuhi identifies two basic varieties of the emotional state. Simple boredom is a response to a tiresome but temporary situation, say, a dull lecture, pointless meeting, or a traffic jam. Existential boredom, or ennui, is a more generalized malaise reflecting overall dissatisfaction with one's life. Existential boredom receives far more literary and scholarly attention. Simple boredom is frequently as dismissed as trivial, perhaps because it is so often associated with young people. Psychological studies claim that undeveloped attention spans, feelings of confinement, limited freedom, inadequate stimulation, and stifling adult oversight all conspire to make boredom endemic to modern young adulthood. Even among adults, being easily bored is seen as juvenile, a sign of emotional immaturity. Tui writes that to admit to suffering boredom is to admit to being childish. Children have no shame when it comes to complaining about being bored. Adults, though they're never immune, are quick to deny that they suffer boredom, and many will brag that they never are bored. They are almost always lying. Punks seem to feel no shame complaining of boredom. 
it is probably a truism to say that punk rock music and culture provided its adherence with an escape from the bland and conventional. John Robb suggests this in his introduction to his oral history of British punk, where he recounts his own teenage years pre and post Sex Pistols. 1975 was boring. 1976 wasn't much better. Living in the mid 70s in a rain swept town was living in the monochrome, and I needed escape and color. And then I heard anarchy in the UK. It was a revelation. Vocalist T.V. Smith and bass player Gail Advert of the Adverts describe a similar epiphany in their own interviews with Rob. Smith explains how they decided to move from Devon to London in 1976, partly because I wanted to be in a band and partly because I didn't want to hang around in Devon. I was bored. There was nothing going on down there that was stimulating. Smith portrayed these sentiments in the 1977 B-side Bored Teenagers. His opening lines poetically depict punk expression as a tool for combating boredom, even as they hint at the futility of this enterprise. Rebellious songs about school are probably as old as rock and roll, but punk songs exhibit what education researchers might term oppositional behavior. The Toronto punk rock band The Fits released the punningly titled Board of Education on the B-side of their lone seven-inch single. The song's opening line, I am Board of Education, makes it clear that this is about an individual student's experience not the school system's decision-making body. Vocalist Paul S. Bonk rails against the lack of freedom in school, which he illustrates by affecting a feminine teacher's voice, admonishing students not to be late. Similar contempt for formal education is exhibited in the song Bored to Death, the opening track from the 1980 debut by G.G. Allen and his band The Jabbers. Allen's lyrics are a clear example of existential boredom. The list of things he's sick of include the human race and life. But school is right up there. In a possible nod to Chuck Berry's classic school days, Allen rhymes school with golden rule midway through the first verse. To my knowledge, there are at least four other punk releases titled Bored to Death, and at least two of those depict tedium in educational settings. The DC hardcore band Government Issue included a song by this title on their 1981 Discord EP, Legless Bull. As in G.G. Allen's song, a school comes up by the end of the first verse. Vocalist John Stabb complains of mind-numbing rote learning with the lyrics, I went to school to learn how to cheat, and all I got were words on a sheet. Finally, Bored to Death is the title of the lead single from Blink-182's 2016 album, California. The title phrase is repeated in the song's anthemic chorus, along with the really clever line, Life is too short to last long, which suggests the distorted temporality of simple boredom, in which dull experiences seem to pass more slowly than exciting ones. The song's pre-chorus lyric, It's a Long Way Back from 17, seems to link the experience of boredom to adolescence, as does its accompanying video, which is set in a high school classroom. The clip's protagonist is a white male Southern California teenager whose mind drifts from a dull class session to imagine an ideal day with his girlfriend. 
Most of the daydreams activities involve small acts of delinquency, like getting kicked out of a record store for monopolizing the demo turntable, or sneaking over a wall into a backyard pool. All of these activities are intercut with footage of Blink-182 on stage at a club, and the teenage couple eventually ends up at their gig. At the end of the video, all of these activities pass by, sped up, and in reverse, and we find that the teenage boy never left that doll club classroom at all, having spent the duration of the song etching its title phrase into his desk. I've just dwelt at length on a Blink-182 video because its suburban setting is another important context for bored teenagers. The historian Dewar McLeod has documented how suburban California localities, like the one depicted in this clip, have spawned vibrant punk and hardcore scenes since the 1980s. McLeod terms Southern California's particular variety of sprawl post-suburbia. These are communities which were once suburbs or exurbs of a larger city, in this case Los Angeles, but grew to become, quote, full-scale contained regions. McLeod goes on to write that, for bored teenagers, this new type of psychogeography represented the worst combination of suburban exile with post-suburban desolation. Several of the California band's McLeod profiles explicitly attack suburban monotony in their song lyrics. The Descendants, which formed in Manhattan Beach, did this ironically in the song Suburban Home. The Adolescents, which formed in Fullerton, described themselves as a group of, quote, bored boys with nothing to do in the chorus of their 1981 song Wrecking Crew. These sentiments are not unique to the youth of Southern California, however. My favorite musical critique of suburban drudgery comes from a Crawley Sussex band who call themselves Suburban Homes. Their 2016 release, Suburban Homes Are Bored, is described on their Bandcamp page as a vitriolic attack on the mundane nature of Western society. I would describe it as an entire EP about boredom, including songs like Welcome to Shitsville, Small Town Boredom, and this track called Cul-de-Sac. As songs like the adolescent's wrecking crew suggest, boredom in young people may precipitate aggressive, delinquent, depressive, or self-destructive behaviors. Summarizing psychological studies on this topic in an article titled Bored to Death, the science writer Anna Gosline reports that highly bored individuals tend to lack the ability to entertain themselves. As a result, they may turn to activities like doing drugs. This may be especially true during adolescence. A number of irreverent punk songs depict teenagers medicating their boredom with substance abuse. The Dead Milkmen parody bored teens in the comic 1988 song Bleach Boys, in which a fictionalized group of friends subdue their existential dread by drinking Clorox. I'm so bored I'm drinking bleach. I'm so bored I'm drinking bleach. I'm so bored I'm drinking bleach. I'm so bored I'm of course, boredom-induced behavior can be quite serious. The Germs lead singer Darby Crash is frequently portrayed as a poster boy for punk rock self-destruction. He infamously emerged from performances bloodied after deliberately injuring himself on stage. And when Penelope Spiris inquired about this in a scene from the documentary The Decline of Western Civilization, Crash explained to her, well, first I did it on purpose to keep from getting bored. Crash's onstage self-harm was arguably prefigured by Iggy Pop, who gave interviewer Dinah Shore a similar justification when he appeared on her television show in 1977. He says, I was bored and angry, and when something demanded action every day, when something kept pestering my mind and I couldn't do anything about it, I'd just simply resort to violence. In addition to these biographical details, some punk rock songs contain sobering treatments of boredom-induced violence. Vancouver punk band DOA repeatedly mentioned teen boredom in their song Suicidal. Bad Religion's Bored and Extremely Dangerous seems like an eerie portrayal of a potential school shooter 
especially given its post-Columbine recording date. Greg Graffin adopts the persona of a fatally bored youth, repeating the lines, I might do harm and bear my right to arm, retribution. A false ending in the middle of the song gives way to an arrhythmic, dreamlike session featuring ticking sounds that suggest either a reference to Pink Floyd or a time bomb. Collectively, these punk songs and examples capture a range of experiences with teen boredom. They also reveal the line between simple and existential boredom is somewhat artificial. Chronic experiences of simple boredom, especially in confining educational or suburban settings, can lead to more pervasive feelings of dissatisfaction. A punk rock song lyric that says, I'm bored, might sound like a juvenile expression of simple boredom, but often morphs quickly into social critique or a portrayal of the more profound existential consequences of boredom. Finally, these songs, combined with evidence from interviews and biographies about punk, add to understandings of boredom and its meaning. In particular, they challenge the sort of moralizing adage that only boring people are bored, or that people who are prone to boredom lack imagination. Writing a song is inherently creative and imaginative, even if it is only to complain about how boring or bored you are. And speaking of songs, because 15 minutes is insufficient time to share all of the punk songs about boredom I've identified, I've listed them at the end of this video in a fake time life as seen on TV compilation infomercial. I'm sure there are some that I've missed and I look forward to having you tell me all about them in the live discussion on September 24th. I will see you then.